Hey, if this is your first time or your first time in a long time, my name is Nathan. Uh, I'm the pastor here at Salem. I think, uh, I think you obviously had a lot of places that you could be this morning. I might be a little biased. I think you chose the right place, if I'm, being, if I'm just being totally transparent and totally honest. Uh, for, I wanna say good morning and welcome again to everyone that's worshiping with us online. Uh, obviously, you had a, an innumerable amount of places that you could be online, whatever website that you're on, but uh, and we're excited that you're here worshiping with us. Uh, we are uh, ending our series, Welcome Home, today. I'm excited about it, but before we jump into the message, uh, I want to let you know something else I'm excited about. If you did not get the email uh, that came out, I believe it was Friday morning, uh, that after the denomination voted, uh, Salem is officially disaffiliated from the United Methodist Church. We are an independent church. Uh, we're grateful for it. We have a lot. There, don't get me wrong. We, there are no enemies. I have many Methodist friends that I love. Uh, and I'm thankful for, I am thankful. Hear me. I am thankful for our history. I'm grateful for how we got to where we are, but I'm also excited about where God is taking us. And so, uh, so again, I, I wanna say thank you to Alfred. I wanna say thank you to uh, everyone that was part of that team, uh, the trustees and the council that have labored. You, if you weren't in those meetings, they have labored alongside the lawyers to get this squared away and get this done. So I wanna say thank you for the opportunity uh, of, of what you've done uh, and gone through there. This is our last week in this series, but what you can see on the screen now is it'll be our upcoming series uh, that we're going into next week. It's called A Revolution. And, uh, and here's what, what we have to understand is that uh, uh, John 10.10 10 says that there's a thief and he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and life abundantly and what we have to understand is that there's freedom that you found if you're here under the sound of my voice and you're you're watching watching and worshiping online you found freedom and, and Jesus has maybe found you wherever it is that you are but there's a hurting and dying world outside the walls of this building there's people that God has given you the opportunity to influence and so what we have to realize is we can't just sit idly by and keep calm there is no opportunity for timidity it's uh, the Bible says that the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. So I don't care if you've been in church 40 minutes or if you've been in this church 40 years, it's time for us to stand up and have a revolution and let the world around us know that whom the sun sets free, come on, we're in John 8, 36. Don't take this off my preaching time, but let me say it. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. There is freedom for every addiction, freedom for every bondage, freedom for every chain that would keep you down there is freedom and Jesus is not wanting us to sit idly by and timidly by and quiet here inside the walls of our church but rather take a revolution to a hurting and dying world amen come on amen so that is our series we're kicking it off next week and here's here's the challenge to you here's the challenge to you we've been we've been talking in this series welcome home now for three weeks and if, if you think I am satisfied with me being a cheerleader for you and us having a good time with Lydia doing an incredible job of leading worship up here, that, that we're just content with hearing things like we should be welcoming home those that have yet to encounter the presence in the person of Jesus, we are sorely mistaken. So next week is our first ever and you're gonna hear this a lot. It's a cultural item that you will hear. Next week is officially on Father's Day, a save a seat Sunday. What does that mean? That means I'm anticipating everybody in here and everybody, in, in, hey, online, you're not excluded. You're not excluded either to go out and find the person that God is giving you opportunity to influence and bring them back, save a seat for them so that they can hear what God is wanting to do. We're going to actually practice what we've been preaching about for the past three weeks, where we've been preaching about welcoming people, where we've been preaching about bringing people home. We're gonna put it into practice and action. God is not interested in our lip service, he's interested in our obedience. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to put your big boy pants on. 
I want you to, I want you to buck up, buttercup. I want you to, I want you to put your, your war clothes, like I said it last week, my play clothes. Go put your play clothes. If you weren't here, go check it out on Facebook and coming soon to YouTube. Go check it out uh, and follow up because we have work to do until, until all of Clarksville, Montgomery County hears about God's goodness until they all encounter his presence and the person of Jesus, we have work to do. So next week, it's gonna be a Save a Seat Sunday where you bring someone with you, and I promise you, they're gonna encounter, they're not gonna encounter the person of Nathan, they're gonna encounter the presence of Jesus, and he is absolutely gonna bring freedom to their life, amen? Come on, amen. Hey, will you partner with me and, and help bring, I don't want, I'm just saying, look, I'll talk to Lydia, because I know she, I'm not saying just invite someone, I want you to be a bringer. There's a difference, okay? Be a bringer, amen? Amen? All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you guys talk a lot today because I believe a church that's alive ought to sound like it. It ought to be vocal. So hey, if, if you haven't been here the past two weeks, let me just give you a brief recap. In week one, we encountered a man named Levi that Jesus found, and the Bible says that Levi was sitting in his tax collector booth. And what we realize is that Levi has find normalcy in an abnormal situation. He's made functional a dysfunctional situation. And in this moment, Jesus comes by and doesn't cast him aside. Jesus looks at him and says, hey, I know you're broken. Hey, I know you've got issues. I know you've got things that you're struggling with. But Levi, beside me, there's room for you. And beside me, you are welcome. We looked last week at the woman who was caught in adultery and she, how she was marched into the middle of the church and, and how there the, the church folk put her on display. And, and we realized that as we went through the message that this wasn't necessarily a message about a woman caught in adultery. This was, this was a message about you and I because I think we can all uh, bring out the, the list and survey everything in our lives that we are currently I think we can all look at the problems in our life and see that, hey, I'm, I'm caught in depression. I'm caught in addiction. I'm caught in perversion. I'm caught in whatever it is that, that you're caught in. I'm caught in fear. I'm caught what, whatever it is. I'm caught in pride. I'm caught in my ego. But here's what I love is in this story, it's not a story of condemnation. It's a story where Jesus, instead of stoning her, which he was lawfully, he had every lawful right to do, Jesus shows up and he gets in her dirt. He gets on her level. And he starts looking at her and saying, hey, if they don't condemn you, then neither do I. And so what he did is we see that what did he do? He welcomed her home. I want to look at a story today. It's, uh, it's in the book, of, uh, it's in the book of, of Luke. Before we, before we get into the verses real quick, I, I, let me, let me kind of set it up this way. I, um, I grew up on 484 Dawson Road, Cumberland Furnace, Tennessee. The telephone number was 931-387-4241. I, 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 just, I grew up there. Um, we built a house. I say we like I had anything to do with it. I did not. Um, I think I was in third grade at that time. It was just, you could, if, easiest way to get there is you go out to Highway 48 and you keep going south. You go to the 48-13 the the split and you just ever so slightly veer to the right. And you go up one hill and down the next and up one hill and you finally take a left at the fire tower. On the left-hand side, there's water towers on the right-hand side. And in the fall, the way the road ever so slightly leans and turns to the left. Just, just, just be in the vehicle with me. You can, in the fall, you can see the leaves kicking up as you go, go down the road and, and they kick up just on, ever so gracefully on that turn. You go down just maybe, maybe a mile, maybe three quarters of a mile and it's the first road on your right. When I grew up there, it was just a gravel road. There was no, there was no pavement on, on Dawson Road. It, I have several scars on my knees and elbows from riding a bike too fast down the hill. You get on Dawson Road and we were, the only, we were one of the only houses when we got out there that didn't have a farm, but everyone else seemed to have a farm. And so if I can just be transparent and honest with you, the smell of manure, whenever I smell it, it reminds me of Dawson Road. It actually brings back a, 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 like good memories to me. I, I don't remember what year it was. 
I, don't, I really don't remember. It was probably, I don't know, maybe early 2000s. I, I'd just come home on a, on a break from, from college in Columbus, and I remember going out there. It felt like we had more trees in the yard than we had grass. But I remember just walking out. I was probably barefoot at the time, just walking out and trying not to, trying to find the smooth stones to set my feet on. And it was, it was the middle of the night, and there was, there was no light pollution there were no street lights. There's no sidewalks. There's still none. But just going out there and looking up at what seemed like a million stars, just as far as you could see, not a cloud in, in the sky, stars uninhibited. And in that moment, I looked up and I, I, look, I'm not, I don't understand like the constellations and like the movements of, of the heavenly masses and things like that. But what I knew in that moment Standing right above me was the constellation Orion. So I just looked and something, something just settled in me. It didn't matter years later if I was in Columbus, Ohio or Northeast Ohio. It didn't matter if I was uh, sleeping in a half-built building in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. It didn't matter when I was sleeping at the base of Kirkjafell Mountain in Iceland. It didn't matter if when I was on the plains of Bujumbura, Burundi, in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. I could take a moment to look up and correlate wherever the constellation Orion was, that's where home was. Home is home where, where I can show up at three in the morning unannounced, back doors open, I can just show up. A home where, now I'm a little bigger now, but even now I will do it gingerly. I, I will just, I'll go in and I'll just sit on mom's lap. I'll like hold myself up so I'm not crushing her. And the couple of you that like laughed at that, that was, that was a little judgmental. I, I, I felt that. I felt that. I'll pray for you. It's all right. I can still, go, I can, I'll just, it, it's home. I can go sit on mom's, I, I can go, I can go home and I can just open up the fridge and, and raid the pantry. I can just unannounced, just walk in. Now, here's the interesting thing. I know enough of you that if I show up at your house at 3 a.m. and open your door, unannounced and try to sit on your lap and then go to your fridge and open up and start eating all your leftovers, I'm going to catch one of several things. I'm going to catch hot lead. I'm going to catch these hands or I'm going to catch a hundred pound dog trying to rip my leg off. Come on now. Why? Because that's not my home. What is home? Home, right here. It's a place where one lives as a member of the household. I wanna look today at the story in, in, the, in the Gospel of Luke, Luke 15. It's one of the synoptic Gospels, meaning it's one of three that are in sync with one another, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The book of John is more so of a love letter to all humanity. I wanna look at the, the story. We call it the prodigal son, but when Jesus was telling it, uh, he did not... He did not give it the, the title, the prodigal son. He just told a parabolic teaching, a parable uh, about this story to prove a point. So let's, let's, uh, let's jump in. And I don't want to, I don't want to read the Bible. Uh, it, it is a story. It's a book of stories, but it's more. It's a book of science, but it's more. It's a book of prayer, but it's more. It's a, it, it's a, it's a book of Proverbs, but it's more. The Bible says that it, the, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld him. And so I don't want to just read the Bible. I want, to, I want us to witness this story. I want us to be part of the crowd, seeing what's going on in this moment. Can we do that this morning? Can we do that? Yes? Yes? All right, good. Here we go in uh, Luke 15, the first few verses. Uh, the Bible says in verse 11 of chapter 15, and he said, Jesus, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property 
that's coming to me. And he divided his property between them, okay? He divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a a far country. And there he squandered his property with reckless Living. I just want to. I want to set the, the the backdrop for this story. So there's three characters, but we only see two of them in this portion and passage that we're going to look at. There's a father and a son, and this is the younger son. And here's what he does. He looks at his father and says, "Give me." Uh, let's put it in NIV, Nathan's interpreted version. Give me what I'm going to get when you die. Give me my inheritance ahead. Of time. I want, hey, Dad, I want your blessing of what you're going to give me before you're ready to give it to me. And and the problem that we have is is this is uh, in, in a Hebrew mindset, this would be something that would cause the young man to be killed for being so grievously offensive to his father and so grievously offensive to his elder. He would have more than likely, had it been found out, been stoned. But what we see is this is a picture of the heart of humanity here in 2021 uh, of where we want the blessing of the Father, but we don't want the boundaries of the Father. We want want everything that we're going to get, everything that we will inherit, but we don't want it inside, watch, watch, inside the jurisdiction of what the Father wants to do in the moment. We, what, what we want is, uh, this, it's the same model that we see throughout the entirety of the Bible. We see it in the Tower of Babel. Where, where in this moment, the, uh, humanity looked and said, let us build a tower that we can ascend the heavens. It wasn't to get in closer contact to God. It was to elevate self and to get self in a posture where it felt important. It's the same pattern that we see in the nation of Israel in the time of the book of Judges. Where the Bible says that every man did what was right in their own eyes. It's, it's the example we see uh, with King Saul, uh, the first king of all Israel, where he deviates from the purpose and plan of Yahweh and in this moment starts to build the kingdom of self. This, this is the problem that we have in humanity right now. We have exalted self to the point that, that we put premier emphasis on opinion on our desires and on what we want, our hopes and our dreams. The problem with that is that is the antithesis of what the Bible says when the Bible clearly states out, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When the Bible clearly uh, writes out, uh, not my will, Jesus would be saying, not my will, but yours be done. It's, it, we have to understand that my words are not on the same level as His words, this is the problem that we see not only in North America but in the church at large where we think we can interpret what his word is. His word says what it says. It is what it is. It is without error. There is no interpretation for me to think, well, I think it says this. I think it says that. The Bible is what it says it is. It it is authored by God, written through men. It is the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the word for me I stand alone on the word of God the B-I-B-L-E it's the Bible can we I gotta I'm sorry because you didn't even know that I had and we're gonna have to talk about it at some point it's hot as all get out up here Jesus take the wheel it is 10 degrees hotter on this platform than it is where you're sitting so I'm sorry if my tattoos offend me I pray that next week you invite me to church and welcome me home here I am it's gonna happen at some point we got to talk about it folks I can't get rid of them and if you want to know the truth I kind of like them so here we are what we see is the issue of the son wanting the blessing of the father, but not the boundaries of the father. This is the story where we pick up. 
This is where we see what's going on in this moment is you have somebody that I want you to do. I want the good things that you have for me, but I don't want to live by the standards that you place in front of me. It's the narrative that humanity is encountering right now where we want our way. We want our desires. We want our dreams instead of submitting them to him. Watch, watch. We understand him. I know I'm belaboring a point, but I really feel like, I don't know if it's for somebody in here or somebody online. We enjoy Jesus as Savior. We don't enjoy Jesus as Lord. We enjoy the fire insurance so that we don't go to hell, but we don't like the Lordship of Jesus where he's in control and whatever he says is what goes, because here's what it really means. If he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. It's not about what I want, it's about what he wants. It's not about what I desire, it's about what he desires. It's a life surrendered to him, amen? Come on, amen? Hey, so what we see is in verse 14, and when he spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need, verse 14. Uh, 15, so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him in the fields to feed the pigs. I could spend three weeks just on this right here. Uh, and, And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. Let me just surmise it because if I go in on this, we're gonna be here the rest of the afternoon. Mind you, it is the Lord's day, not the Lord's hour. But I will be cognizant of your pot roast in the crock pot. A life lived outside the boundaries of the father is a life starved of living a life he went off and hired himself out to one of the citizens and sent him in the fields and he was longing to be fed with the pods that pigs ate and no one gave him anything when I live a life outside the boundaries of the father what happens I starve myself I starve myself from it's not that he doesn't want there are natural repercussions to the sins that I commit. For every action, there is a, come on church, for every action, there is a, re. so we can't be mad when things happen in our life. Maybe the things that are happening in our life is because we're trying to live a life outside the boundaries of the Father and fight and figure out that we're starving ourselves to death. I don't wanna camp in there. If I was gonna preach there, we could spend some time there. But here's what I wanna see. Verse 17 right here. But when he came to himself, turn to somebody and say, he woke up. Come on, oh, that was terrible, church. Turn to somebody and say, he woke up. All right, turn to your JV pick. Say, he woke up. That's the person you didn't go to the first time. Somebody else, say, he woke up. How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But here I perish with hunger I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and earth before you and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Can we just, can we just witness this for a moment? He's in the middle of the pig pen and he, he's looking and saying, I've, I've got nothing around me. And Wait a minute, my, my dad's servants, they... They're, they're not starving. They're not going without. I, I can go to them. Okay, so I got I to gotta get the apology right. Be like, hey, dad. No, I shouldn't say dad. Maybe, maybe, maybe I should say uh, father. Yeah, okay, that sounds more formal. Hey, hey father, I've, I've sinned against you and, and heaven and earth. No, maybe I should do heaven and heaven first and then earth. I, I, what's, it's like he, he's, he's going through his mind what his discourse will be when he speaks to his father, he's, like, he's practicing. I mean, just I can't prove it. It's just conjecture. It's actually a parable, so it didn't really happen. But just let's imagine that he's rehearsing this story over and over. Kind of like when we rehearse how we should apologize and how we go into a situation and we're like, oh, I don't know, should I say this? And how should I get into it? And should I cast blame? Dad, I'm really mad at you because you like, no, no, no. If I do that, then he won't accept me. And so, Father, I, I've sinned against heaven and earth, and I'm no longer worthy to be uh, worthy, uh, I should be, uh, like, I, I don't, I don't, I don't he, he's rehearsing the whole thing, practicing his apology. The next verse right here, it says, and he arose, verse 20, and came 
to his father. He came to his senses first, and then he walked and came to his father. But the Bible says, and while he was a long way off, the father saw him. What was that moment like? What, what I love is that the father was not busy doing something else. The father was anticipating the son to come home. The father was not, he was not pushed, he was, he, was not, he was not angry in this moment. What we see is the father on the brow of the hill. Can, can you see, come on, imagine if it was your son or your daughter and, and they left and, and all of a sudden just, just in the horizon you see a little trail of, of dust rising up in the air, and, and if, you're, if you're the father, you're, you're looking, you're saying, that, that looks like the outline, you can tell somebody from a distance, you can tell when, that, that looks like my son, I can't really see because the, the sun is in my eyes, but that, that really looks like his frame, and, and I, I, think, I think that might be him, and so what does the father do after seeing him? He starts running. In Jewish manner, this is totally inappropriate it, because uh, they wore tunics and it would have been shameful for a Jewish man to pull up his tunic and show his bare legs. We now wear the shortest shorts possible to show as much leg as humanly possible. 2021, parabolic teaching of Jesus. Pick yours, don't really care. But Hebrew custom would have been that if he was running, he was actually doing, an, he was being shameful and didn't care because what he saw was his son that was coming home. And in this moment, he's, that's, that's my son. And so he felt compassion on the inside of him, a deep on the inside of him, inside of his bowels, empathy, because I think that's my son. He runs to him, he embraces him, and he starts to kiss him. But hear, hear me out, the reason he's running is because Jewish uh, understanding would have been if the elders of the city encountered and saw the son, they would, uh, per, they would perform a, a, situ, a ritual called kezaza, where they would take a, a piece of pottery and break it on the ground, meaning that the son was cut off from the body and from the city, and more than likely, the son would have been immediately stoned. So see this father running with the, all the might that he has to beat the elders of the city to get down to his son and he doesn't just embrace him in a hug that word means he violently fell upon the son what did he do he covered the son so that those that would accuse him he would look at them and say if you want to kill him you have to kill me first if you want to get to him you have to go through me it says he starts kissing the boy all over his face so she's Kissing him. What is the boy saying? He's trying to shout ahead as his father's running to him. Dad, I've sinned against heaven and earth. And you know, why, why is, he, is he running at me because he's angry? Is he running at me because he's mad? Is he running at me out of disappointment? Why, all, what is the perspective of the young man in this moment as his father is running full speed ahead and tackles him on the ground? The only thing that changes his mind out of the, father, the fact that his father is mad is that the father starts to kiss him all over. It's like, Dad, no, you don't understand. I smell, I smell like the hog pen, but his dad doesn't care. He continues to kiss him anyway. Dad, I, I smell like the filth that I've been living in. And, and the, the intimacy of the father is not dissuaded by the circumstances and filth of the son, covers him, falls upon him, just showering, watch, 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 love, mercy, grace, just covers him totally. And the boy, he's like, father, I've sinned against heaven and earth, and he's trying to get, he's trying to get the statement out, but he, all he can, he's being smothered by his father, he's like, I've sinned against heaven and earth, and I'm no longer worried to be, whether they be called your son. And all of a sudden, he can't even get the words out because the father starts shouting to the servants. He starts shouting, and he says, he says uh, uh, Father, I've sinned against heaven and earth. But the father said to his servants, totally dismisses conversation with the son. Completely dismisses it. And all of that was the intro for the three points I want to give you right now. 
the Father is doing one thing and one thing alone. He is welcoming the boy. Not just, hey, you're welcome. He's welcoming him home. And I think in the actions of the Father, we see the perspective of Jesus that I want us as a church body to embrace. That when we welcome people, we welcome them home. The first thing the Father does is he shouts, he says, go get the best robe. Don't, 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 I'm not interested in the, don't, don't, like, I mean, like the conversation, it's, it's a cluster in this moment between the servants, the elders, the father, the son, and the servants like, what, what, what robe do you, what, the blue one? No, 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 the best one. The one with the tassels on it? No, the other one. The red one? No. And, and, I mean, there's just this dialogue. It's a parable, so we don't, it didn't happen. But just work with me. Which robe? I want the best robe. Why? Because father's robes are the best for covering the stench of the hogs. Come on, he covered him. Watch. So that when people looked at the boy, they couldn't tell the difference between the father and the boy. Here's, here's what it says is 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake, he, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What, what does that mean? That, that we would have, we would be covered and have right state. It doesn't matter that we spent life living in the hog pen. It doesn't matter that in the moment we smell like the filth of all the decisions that we've made. In this moment, we become the righteousness of God because we are covered. We've been in this moment, watch, watch here in, a, in Romans 4.25, he de, he was, Jesus was delivered over to death for our trespasses and was raised to life for our justification. What does justification mean? It means just as if we'd never done it. He was, he was covered in the, guess what, guess what robes mean? Robes mean that you're, you're safe. He covered him. He welcomed him home. What did he say? He said, hey, son, here, regardless of what you've done in my home, you're safe. You have safety here in my home. Second thing he did I know I'm making Emily work overtime. Can we give a shout out to Levi and Emily up in the booth? Come on, they are awesome. Jerry as well. <laughs> selfish plug for them, selfish plug for me so I could catch my breath. Second thing right here. He said, go get the ring, put it on his finger. Rings were a symbol of authority. Watch, the father was mantling the son with the authority that he would have had had he stayed in the home. What did the father do? He put a ring on, he loved him, and allowed the son to be restored. In, in the father's home, he's safe. But here with the rings in the father's home, he's loved He's loved. He, he puts these rings on, and, uh, and, and the, boy is, the boy is trying to say, no, Dad, you don't understand all the mistakes I've made. You don't understand all the issues. All the, I have, God, Dad, I screwed up. I, watch, I'm no, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Let me just be as one of the hired servants. That's what we do. We understand all of our screw-ups. And so what we do is we say, hey, God, I've screwed up too bad to really, really fall in line with your original purpose and plan for my life. So maybe I can just be, I can settle for plan B, option B. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Just make me one of the hired servants. And, and dad, I know it'll just be good enough. It'll just, I'm okay, I'm okay, even though I know you're, I know you said that you know the plans that, that you have for me, plans to prosper me and bring me to an expected, I know that, but dad, I've screwed up so much, then I, I'll just settle for plan B. Plan B is good for me, dad, I'm okay with that. The father says, no, 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 put the ring on his finger. He will be restored to the original intent that I had for my son. 
she will be restored to the original intent that I had for my daughter. The, perp, the, the Bible says that the gifts and callings are without repentance. What does that mean? It means it doesn't matter how bad you screw up. If you want freedom and you want to come home, that you don't have to settle for plan B. You don't have to settle for option B. You can come home and be absolutely restored to the original intent and dream that God had for your life. Hey, guess what? Your past is unauthorized to describe to you what your worth is. Your, your screw-ups, ma'am, sir, they don't have jurisdiction to assign your value. Only the Father does. Come on, that's good news for somebody right here. It is, I don't care how big, bad, ugly you've sinned. Your sin can't assign your value. Your sin can't assign your worth. That is relegated to one person and one person alone, the Father. And if he says you're the apple of his eye, then I don't care how bad of hogs and pens you smell like. You are the apple of your Father's eye. Don't let, don't let your past, don't let, don't let old relationships... Don't let poor decisions, don't let a bottle, don't let a needle, don't let anything tell you what your worth and value are except one person alone, and that's the Father. Come on, that's good news. That's freedom for somebody. Put a robe on him because he was safe. Put a ring on his finger because he was loved. The last thing he did, he said, go put shoes on his feet. Lydia's gonna come up here. She's, she's gonna soften the tone because I know I'm, I've been super loud right now. She's gonna soften the tone for her for real quick. And what did he do? He said, go get the shoes. Put them on his feet. Why? Because the son had been walking so waywardly that he needed the tools to grow to pattern his walk to follow the Father. He needed, he needed things necessary so that, so that his waywardness would get worked out of him, so that when he walked, it felt different than when he had previously been walking. So that as he journeyed in the future, it didn't feel like the journey to and from the hog pen. It felt like, watch, watch, he was giving tools that would help him figure out who he was supposed to be when he became the man of the house. Here's what the Bible says right here, right here. It says, it says Romans, I'm sorry, Psalms 119, 105, that your word, O Lord, is a lamp to my feet. It's a light to my path. When I begin, when I get the tools to grow and walk after the Father, the Word becomes alive and it starts telling me how I should walk and where I should go instead of my own waywardness on the inside of me trying to exalt myself outside of the boundaries of the Father. Here, here's what it says in, in 2 Peter 1.19. We also have the word of the prophets as confirmed beyond doubt. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to a lamp shining in a dark place. When, when you're welcomed home and you're given tools to grow, it will help you. So that as you get into dark situations and dark moments, that it will, watch, 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 watch. It will help you to follow after in the same manner that he would witness the Father walking. I mean this with every fiber of my being, Salem, that our job is to do one thing and one thing alone, introduce people to the presence of Jesus. And we will do that by welcoming them and making this a place where it is home where everyone who comes through our door, if they want freedom, if they, I don't care what they're struggling with, if they want freedom, it's home. If they want help, this can be home. 
I don't, I don't care what the problem is that they have in their life. You know what? Here's the thing. You, you're not, you don't get to choose when you're born the temptations that you'll struggle with. You don't, you don't pick those out. You do have a choice in how you handle those temptations. So we're not going to discriminate between temptations that people struggle with. What are we going to do, Salem? Come on, we're going to lift up free hands and let everyone around us know that whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And in this, in this building, you are welcome and you are home. You are loved, you are safe, and you are given the tools to grow because God has a dream for their lives just as much as he has a dream for our lives. Well, that's what it means to welcome people home. That's what it means to welcome people home. That's what it means to welcome people home is that, hey, it's safe here. Hey, you're loved here. Hey, we're going to challenge you to grow. We're going to challenge you to step up and see that God has a bigger and better plan for your life every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around, just for the sake of privacy. If this is a message that as I've been preaching, you it feels like an anthem for the church, for folks that God is sending us. But if you want to be real honest in this moment, maybe you feel like the prodigal. You feel like the wayward son. Can I just let you know this one thing? The definition of prodigal is the action or person recklessly extravagant to the point of giving all they have away. I don't see prodigal tendencies in the son. I see prodigal tendencies in the father that he gave and gave and gave and gave regardless of what the son did he gave chance and opportunity and I'm so glad that we serve the God of a second chance I see the extravagant prodigal love inside the heart of our heavenly father so maybe you feel like the son that's been wayward if that's you in this moment you're like hey I need someone to come call me home here you are safe here you are loved and here we will give you the tools to help you grow